So with the tutor, I felt more comfortable talking straight because, you know, they're not thinking of the test. So I was like, all right, cool. But let me get to talk to you guys right now. I'm sharing. That's fine. I think we're recording. <clears throat> all right. All right, let me come back to this one. Let's start with the second part. That's just what we talk about right now. And then we'll... Uh, Okay, so for the DNA and the amino acids, it's kind of the same thing. How much I expect you guys to kind of know. So if you don't have to draw it, it's, it's probably going to be a little bit more like the homework for that week. Right? Sorry, just yeah. to here. So I think if you guys go on the Google Drive where you guys downloaded the assignment when we were doing it in class for week two, you guys remember this? So I, I, I tried putting the keys up. I know this one's live. I'm not sure if the one for the first in class is live, but if you guys take a look at this, this is kind of like how much I expect you to know the DNA themselves, right? You remember the definitions of like, hey, what's a nucleotide, which is all three of the fragments? Oh, this one that's going to be better. Like this guy, right? So, Nucleotide, like a phosphate, the sugar, and the next part of this base. Right? Um, for the nucleoside, it excludes the phosphate base. I right? see so you draw these two. And then we're talking about the sugar phosphate backbone. Then it's just these two guys. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, can you, can you like, uh, so I will ask, but I could, no, I don't know. I could ask questions about, you know, this kind of stuff, bus structure. You want to draw them, it's just, can you identify them? Right? Yeah. And then the, the bases themselves, this is kind of at the level that everybody wants you guys to know. You don't have to know like which one exactly, well, like where exactly does your nitrogen land or where is your, your uh, carboxyl group or carbonyl group, sorry. Um, what I'm going to uh, ask you about is more like this. Like you guys can see that the pyramidine, like it has one, one, just a single six uh, member ring. And for that, the ones you're going to be using is cytosine, uracil, and thymine. Right, so that's where I do my thing that helps me remember. It's a uh, little pyramid, you cut one stone at a time. So then, pyramid beam, C U T, one circle, but like that one stone. Then the purines is the other way, which is now we have two rings, one five, one six. In my head, as long as you remember you got two rings, you can add one. Does that make sense? So you don't have to be able to draw them by memory, just recognize them when you see them at this level. The, back, the DNA itself, again, same thing. I'm not going to make you draw it. I just need you to know what they're labeled. And the other one for that one is uh, you should know uh, the important connections, right? And we also, <coughs> for the DNA, we only we study it off the sugar. So when you're looking at that sugar, you got to be thinking about this. There's an oxygen here. Then you have your first carbon, your second carbon, third carbon, fourth. This connects this way. And then the fifth part is hanging out out here. Right? When we talk about the DNA, the three that matter is going to be number two. All right, what does this one determine? Mm -hmm. See, RNA. RNA. RNA and DNA. Yeah. If you have an H, you know what we're talking about. DNA. There you go. Now, <coughs> so what if the second part gives you this? What is the third part? Oh, so the third part, what does this one work with? Um, it attaches to the oxygen on the phosphate backbone. Yes, sir. Exactly. This would be the phosphate group of the next molecule. This is where you basically make a linkage spot to make sure the chain keep going, right? And then the other important one is number five. And this is where you have, where you have what group do you have there? The Z? Wait, which D? What, what, what group is that? The, the phosphate group. Phosphate group. Yep. P, D, L. So in this one, I will pick on you because of this, just knowing those three spots, right? So you got to know number three, DNA, RNA. Sorry, number two, DNA, RNA. Number three is the linkage to the phosphate group. Number five, both the phosphate groups. That makes sense. The order goes out. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So they'll go into the uh, first themselves. 
Same thing like that. And again, who started, who started studying their amino acids? Everybody? Yeah? You want to draw one? Yeah, you got this. Come on, let's go. All right, so uh, I want you to pick people on the right hand side of the class over there. You can pick whatever you need. So, for example, to draw an amino acid, um, what are the five parts that an amino acid has? R group. Uh, you got one R group. Amino group? Yes. Carboxyl. Carboxyl. All right, let's go down and see if you got it. What's your amino group? Remember those? You don't have to draw this for the test. I'm just Nitrogen. There we go. And then two hydrogens connect to the nitrogen. Yes. All right. And then uh, what else do you have? You see your carboxyl? Yeah. I won't make you do this on the test, but it's good that we know. All right, carboxyl. And then what else do we have? I agree. Final thing? Hydrogen. Hydrogen, yeah. All right, so that's your base for an amino acid. You won't have to draw them in the test, but you would, you would have to recognize them, right? So, um, let me see. If so, all right, go put the labels on these guys. Do you need to know about all the like different types of bonds like between the different macromolecules, like peptide bonds? Uh, wait, let me get to that one. Let me finish this one real quick and then we'll jump in. All right, so let's say I told you to, to um, circle the amino group. This is your amino group. So, so, so who else? can somebody open up the slides to the functional group? Let me see if I got them. So this guy, right? So we're talking about the amino group. There, we're going to be looking at what kind of jumps off from that first carbon we really care about, like your alpha carbon. And whatever's jumping out for that would be, in this case, the nitrogen and the two hydrogens, right? So if I say circle the amino group, yeah, circle now, yeah. All right, so that's what you're going to for. Does that make sense? If I say, um, give me a square on the on the carboxyl group. So for the carboxyl group, you're looking at the carbon and all, and all the oxygen groups with it. So, right. So that'd be your carboxyl group. Is that making sense? In, I believe in that PowerPoint for that. Uh, I think it's the next one after this one, but. You can kind of see they'll do this kind of coloring. You can see your amino group is your, your NHs, your carboxyl group is your C with your, your O's, and then your other group is going to be your R group, which would be just the top one, right? So for that one, there are 20 amino acids, but I'll show you how I kind of want you to start hunting them down to figure out the four different types. You don't have to know all the structures, just know how to identify the types. But yeah, you, I, there was two questions. What was yours? Is there a difference between on the uh, carboxyl group? The single bonded oxygen is there a difference between writing the O negative and the hydroxyl group? Is it the same thing? It's the, the water's pH will change whether you have a hydrogen or not, okay. right? Yeah. If as long as you draw C double bond O with a negative charge, because you're missing that positive charge on the hydrogen, mm -hmm. that drawing is correct. Okay. If you draw C double bond O and an H with no charge, right, because it cancels out, mm -hmm. then you're correct. Okay. Yeah, so as long as you do one or the other, you're okay. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, cool. Um, one, two, three, four. So in your notes, you guys, amino acids, five five groups, right? And I'm bringing this up because the important ones are basically these two, right? Because remember, if, if I told her, hey, draw the next amino acid here, or if you remove the next reaction, it would show up here, and then the nitrogen, the amino group, is the one that links up to this oxygen with that H. If you give it a water, then you up, and you have your next amino show up. Yeah. So that's kind of like for DNA, that sugar phosphate backbone, like this, where you have that linkage from five to three. 
The amino acids that the next one is you start at N, you go through the carbon, right? You come off over, and here you show up the next amino acid like this. N, carbon, carbon, like that, right? And here we'll be the next carbon. It only has one H off of it, right? Or would it have two? That's one. So nitrogen, uh, the only thing I learned from the whole chemistry part is that it needs three partners. One, two, and that's your third one. Your third. Okay. You're not going to have to draw that either. But I just want you to remember like, that's the connection on how you're making the chain. And then we have to treat the R groups. I'm going to treat them a little bit differently. Yes. Can you explain what the R group is again? Okay. Before I do, keep going. DNA wise, are you guys comfortable with what you have to learn for the DNA? The chain, and then the whole pyr pyrimidines, the bases, and the number of rings? Yeah? All right. Let's go to the polymers. I think the question was to go over how, how we make the, the, the reaction. So I'm gonna go back and draw a little bit more before we go to the R groups, yeah? So one more second. So in this case, I have a slide on my drawing stuff. All right, that's what we have on the board right now. So here we go. All right, so for this one, there's what uh, Cody. Yes, Cody drew it, right? You have our first amino acid. It starts from the end. There's his alpha carbon. There's the carboxyl group, right? The two oxygens. There you can see that this oxygen is going to steal the hydrogen from this amino group, right? So it's going to take two hydrogens with it. If one of the hydrogens left behind, like, excuse me, what are we doing right now? Morgan. Morgan said, right, there's an H that stays behind because there's three, two left. One stays with that nitrogen, and then this nitrogen ends up with that carbon. And that's what you're seeing there. Yeah. And for this one, the main thing to kind of remember here is the orientation is specific, right? We start at the end terminus, and then we call this the C terminus. So we have N, this is the first amino acid, C, N, the second amino acid, C. Yeah. So is that the glyco something <laughs> linkage? Is that what reaction is happening? Glycosidic? So the glycosidic linkage, or is that only between polymers and monomers? So uh, uh, glycosidic, that is when you're talking about sugars. Uh, so, so this is a dehydration. So they're both called dehydration because you're both in both cases you're taking out yeah. water, right? So that's the process of taking out water is dehydration. Yeah. Because you're gluing proteins here, it's called a peptide bond. Uh, in the other case, because you're gluing sugar, then it's the glycosidic linkage. Okay. Everyone comfortable with this? Yeah? All right, cool. So for this one, this, let's just make sure. When we're studying these, to me, both of these go together. Well, this is where you, you kind of they come back up, right? So for the first one, let's start it backwards because they're the easiest one to remember, right? Um, for the proteins, the R groups, I just want you to know that there's four different types, yeah. And what I kind of the way I remember them is that I look for specific functional groups. And those will be my clues to what type they belong to. Yeah. So if we start, if you guys start making your rules for this, guys. The first one we're looking at, let's look at this, right? Um, or my favorite one is the acidic. You have something that's acidic. And what's something that you guys see in the R side, in the R side of the group, right? You see C, double bond with O, and then single bond with O, that carboxylic acid, right? So if you see C, 
Oh. Oh. When you see this, you know you're working with an acid. So whether it has one carbon in the middle or two carbons in the middle, as long as you see this show up, you should be making sure you think that amino acid is an acidic, has an acidic carbon. Let's look at the next one. We're looking at basic, right? What are, what are we looking at? What are, what are we seeing? Nitrogen. That's right. So you can ignore the carbons. What are we seeing? NH3. Plus, you're seeing here in this case, what I look at is we see that we have two nitrogens stuck to, to, uh, to a carbon, right? So you see there's a carbon there, NH2, and NH2 plus, right? And here I see that NH plus sticking around, right? So we have NH plus carbon to carbon. But what you're looking for is this NH plus, NH plus, NH plus, NH plus. That's my basic stuff. Then we have uh, the next one is going to be our polar group. All right, what are we looking at? We're kind of uh, hunting for the polar group. That's right. What's the difference between this polar group and the acidic? So the acidic has a carboxyl atom. Yes, sir. The polar is the one. What's always called? Hydroxyl. Hydroxyl. There you go. So hydroxyl is one of the ones you're going to see a lot, right? One, two, three. Even though it's after a ring of carbon, it doesn't matter. As long as this is at the edge, you know what we have, right? One, two, three. And uh, so OH is one of the patterns. If you see a carbon going to a loose, switch <coughs> is another pattern, right? AKA my favorite amino acid, I don't know who else is, but you know, this is the one that helps fold up your protein. So it's super important, SH. And then the other one is this double bond O. Or the NH2. Right? If you see any of these three markers, you know we're working on the polar side chains. Yeah. And then once I do that, sorry, polar hydrophilic HP. Right? Then we get to these. So these are, remember, they're the boring ones or stuff is hidden, right? Hydrogen, boring, methyl group. Right, that's the only one that's non-polar out of all these. It's the methyl group. If you see carbon with hydrogens, it's going to be on the non-polar, uh, and it's going to be on the hydro side, right? Carbon, 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 carbon. Only one nitrogen. So at that point, if it doesn't, like you see here, we're looking for like those NH3 pluses or the charged ones. If it's not charged, it's going to be non-polar. Not polar, same thing. We got carbon here. There's, there's sulfur, but it's hidden inside, so it's still going to be acting like a, a, a non-polar, a chain, a L shape, a, a methyl group on the side of the chain, non-polar methyl group at the end, non-polar methyl group with the short version, non-polar. Right. So if you just see carbons or just stick drawings in your head, you should be like, "This is boring." It should be non-polar and hydrophobic. Yeah. So you won't have to draw them, but I do want you to recognize them. So this will be my. In my head, this is like my cheat sheet that I'm thinking about when I'm seeing this. Yeah. So would you guys feel comfortable picking these out, identifying them? All right. So here they're color coded, but imagine I took everything away, right? The purple's gone, the yellow's gone, and I give you this amino acid. Right? If I tell you, hey, tell me what, what it follows into. That's why it's really important for you guys to know what the faction is made out of, right? Because if you look at any of them, what are the two things that we're going to find? We're going to find an amine group in the front, which is going to be an H3N plus, which makes it look something like this, right? But since it's not the side chain, it's not going to matter. The other part is on the right side, you have the carboxyl group, C double one O with O, which will make it look like it's an acidic part, right? That's where your amino acid comes from, the name itself. Don't get fooled by these parts. You know, hey, once you find an amino group, a carboxyl group, then you're wondering from this central alpha carbon, what's going on above? And you use this table to kind of get you to pick what, what group falls into. Yeah? All right. 
that answers most of the questions on this side. But I believe Morgan's question was still left behind. You answered it with the, with the drawings. I did. With the peptide bonds. Okay. Okay. I feel like you said polypeptide. Maybe I'll show. No, I was just wondering if we like needed to know the different types of like linkages between the active molecules and like the glycosidic linkages, but you answered that. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. So there it's getting rid of water, it's called dehydration. But then based on what you're gluing, you give it the name of what you have, right? It's either proteins, or peptide bonds, or the sugars. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right, so for this part up here, I think I answered it pretty well, right? I feel like you should be comfortable with the nucleotides, with, with the amino acids. You don't have to memorize the bases themselves, like each position of the chemical, but how, kind of how they're arranged. And, and for the amino acids, it's more about can you pick out the functional groups to figure out what that amino acid is. And then we have know about pyrimidines and purines. Yeah you, yeah, you should know your pyrimidines and purines. Tell them apart just by the ring number and which bases fall under it. Right, so that's where I do my pyramid thing. So pyramid, cytosine, here, so I mean, okay. And what do we know about peptide bonds? I think I answered that pretty well. And polypeptide formation. So I think, yeah, we covered that. We should be fine. So now let's go to question number one. <coughs> right, so this one was part of the essay that was due today. Since I forgot to remind you guys, we're going to move the deadline to Friday. It's a quick one page, uh, just um, bringing up, I think it was emergent property. So an emergent property, like who can find an emergent property from my right side back there? Yes, emergent property. Yeah. So Me? Yes. Whip off my notes. Yeah. Emergent properties. Okay, in approaching the whole to understand the parts, like thinking what's a cake made of, and then you go through the specific ingredients. Exactly, right? So it's like out of the, the wait, sorry, sorry, say it again. The whole, the like cake. approaching, like approaching the whole to understand the parts. So like approaching a cell to understand like the function of each organ else. Oh, that's backwards, backwards. But this is, yeah. So it's like, how does the understanding the, 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 the components that make up the cell end up coming together to give you that extra property on top? I thought that was it reductionism. <laughs> yeah, so reductionist approach is kind of how you said it. You grab, like if you want to study a cake, and you start breaking down what each one can do, right? For the emergent properties, like kind of what things comes together as you put it together. So when you bring in the flour, temperature, the sugar, the yeast, all those comes together, they give you that final thing, which is going to be the cake. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now that analogy, I need you to explain to something outside of this class, not a cake. Not a cake. Okay, something else. Good. It could be anything. So that's going to be your guys' essay. So have any ideas? It could be a machine. It could be people, relationship. You know, anything you can think about of getting the idea together of how do small things come together that because of the way they, they function or interact, they end up building up the bigger thing. Yeah. It's informal. I don't need resources. You can just, you know, throw in ideas and then we should be good to go. But bring up that, that idea that when you bring up uh, understanding the parts and as they come together, they give you something extra or something that the parts themselves couldn't do. Yeah. Yes. So basically the difference between reductionist and emergent is that the reduction it focuses, like it says, on the isolated components or the specific parts. Whereas emergent focuses on the broader properties that come out of the parts. Exactly. So normally when I have this table, I was like in my notes, I literally have errors. Right? So it's like we're going from really small things like the atoms and molecules. And what we're doing right now is just basically going up. Right? 
So we understand how small things like other one, <coughs> organelle after organelle after organelle, with the whole thing of like, once you understand how each part of the organelle comes together, we can build up a cell that has a whole good function, right? Um, so that's basically you're going kind of up in sizes. That's the way I see it, right? And then, like you said, the other case would be we would go down and it'd be like, we would have to then break up each single part where I'm like, hey, how does a microtubule work? And we talk about, hey, the microtubules, one end is, grows really fast, one grows really slow. And based on that, we can trap one of the ends or give like stabilize the other end to change its dynamics. Yeah? But you're right, it's the, the thing that we're focused on on our study, right? Is it, if it's the small thing going upwards or if it's the big thing and we're going down? In size. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. I see lost eyes. Okay. I see a few head knocks. I'm gonna take it as a yes. So give me that paper. I think in here I did give a um, emergent and reductionist approach. Let me see emergent. Yeah. So emergent. I, I did talk about the microtubules. And that's the thing we're talking about right now. So let me combine three things. The microtubules. Remember, those are those. Uh, cytoskeleton elements that build up to build the straw. The other thing that we have is gonna be motor proteins that can move along that straw. And then we have the vesicles, the fat bubbles, that basically they can encapsulate things. Once you put those three things together, this is where you get the thing about how you can actually traffic proteins, right? You have the microtubule, which is gonna guide you where you're gonna go. You trap your, your, your protein inside the fat bubble, and then your motor protein can literally walk that fat bubble over to where you need to go, yeah? And then, the reductionist approach is going backwards, which would be like if the thing that we're trying to study is the DNA, we then try to break it down into what the DNA is made of, right? And then that could be like, hey, what's it have? The sugar phosphate, uh, sugar phosphate backbone. Um, then you have your different nitrogenous bases. And then we're like, oh, each base has a final partner that helps us with replication, blah, 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 blah. Yeah? All right. So I need some of those coming in. Yes. Would um, the nitrogenous bases, uh, like an RNA sugar, have the same? Like, would it would still be like guanine, thymine, all that? There's one big difference. What's the big difference between RNA and uh, with the base? RNA has uracil, <laughs> it doesn't have thymine. Correct. That's, that's the only big difference. From the nitrogenous bases. Yeah. Right, yeah, from the nitrogenous bases. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, um, how much do we need to know about isomeres for the midterm? So the isomeres, I didn't go that much into it. Um, so for the isomeres, it's kind of talking about um, when proteins are, are being, or when carbon chains are being made, they have, remember, four bonds they can have, right? And they normally set up in this like tetrahedral pattern, like so it's three in like this going down, and the four of them sticking up like that. So imagine this would be the central carbon, my fingers would be the three things that combine to and one points down. The, the thing about the chirality is because the molecules can't like move like this past each other, it, it has a certain idea, like a certain position, like where if I move clockwise, you can see it with thumb, pointing finger, and middle finger, right? If I in my arm would end up pointing that way. So this my left hand, if I have the same three atoms, right? My thumb, my pointing finger, my middle finger set up like this, it, I can't move my hand in any way that'll make all of them match up. Right? Like if my arms are matching, my thumb is matching, and my middle finger is matching, you can see that technically my pointing finger is aiming in different directions, right? If I make my middle finger try to match, like I can't get them to set up in the same position, that's your chirality. Because like I said, the molecules can't shift through each other. I didn't go that much into it, but it is important. I'm not gonna bring it up in the, it's not gonna bring it up in the test, but because it's a 3D shape and I didn't want you guys to get the 3D models, it's really hard to explain it. The, the only thing to know, just for you guys on stage, is you, at the atom level, based on how they shape themselves, it'll be messed up from that point, and it builds up. You can see it at that point. You can also get it for um, proteins. They'll, sh they'll change their shape, and then because they kind of pop into a position, they can't switch into a different one, or they'll be like, they'll have like different arrangements. And some of them are super messed up, like they'll mess up our, our I think our brain is one of the things they can mess up. And really with, with motor proteins, but we're not going to bring it up. So it's just it's about 3D confirmation, but that one's too, uh, you'll probably go into it later, especially for neural people. You'll visit it a lot. All right. And the other one is do we have to know all seven of the main functional groups and in how much detail? 
Uh, yes, and I love them. So yes, you do. So kind of like I do, I ask you guys in class like this, right? So what's this guy? This guy? Yeah, and then you have the C double bond L. What's that one? Yeah. Um, yeah, so know all of them like that. You should be able to just see that when you come off a carbon chain, make sure you include the um, all the elements, right? Like, for example, here you have an amino acid. If I'm talking about the so the hydro, right? It's the S and the H. Here we're talking about a phosphate group. It's the phosphate and the four oxygens. So you make sure you encapsulate the whole thing. And the other thing to note here is that only the methyl group is nonpolar. Everything above that way is going to be polar. Right. All right. Any other big questions? Because I think that's all from the review session form. Do we need to know uh, like the different types of proteins, like support proteins, and like there's like twelve of them. What do you mean? The um, okay. like transport proteins. Yeah, like storage proteins, defensive mm -hmm. proteins, like receptor proteins. Um, like there's like the functions. Or are we gonna have to know like? Examples of them, I guess. No, I'm not going to go into that detail. It's good for you to know that they can do all those jobs, mm -hmm. right? Um, but to be honest, I think later on in the, in the text is when you go ahead and into, we start actually looking at those jobs when they're doing it. So right now they just gave you an intro of like proteins can physically move things, cut things, or they can bind to specific partners. Like they're super shaped um, and charged to make perfect binding partners. That's it. Yeah. Question about the exam. Is there any multiple choice or is it all short answer? So far, I got like 20 questions and there's a little bit of everything. Okay. Gotcha. So it's going to be like, um, so it's like definition where it'll be like matching answers. Then I have a section which is like, um, or part B, I call this short response. So it'll be like, I'm giving you like less than a quarter of the page and it'll be, I don't want you to write a whole essay, right? So it'll be like, hey, if I ask you a specific thing, Give me the give me the like your most your most condensed precise definition of it, and I might give you give me a quick example of how it's connected. Right. So be quick on those, and then at the end, right now I'm still working on it for part C. It's going to be one long question. So you guys might have a choice between two or three, and those I'm expecting like maybe like half a page. And um, yeah, those will be the long ones. So one of the things I'm saying is like when you go to thinking about is when you go through the test, I want you to look at how many points a question's worth, right? And it's like, I'm not gonna expect you to write an essay for two points, right? So normally if you see a longer question, spend more like six six points is maybe worth six minutes of your time because you know the whole point. The whole test is 50 minutes, right? If it's only worth two points, it should only be worth 10 minutes. Like I should have done the number. But yeah. Um, and Yeah, so, it's, so I still, I have the spaces reserved I, no one's hit, no one's hit me up to say they want a specific quiet space or like a specific pre or post time thing. If you do, please reach out to me so we can I can start putting them in like who's going to take over room and everything. And then I'll have the test printed out, and then you guys should be should be pretty good to go. And I still haven't checked it to see how clear it is about the the question types. I think some of you guys gave me comments on the homework, right? You guys were telling me like I didn't give you guys hints of like hey, it's multiple answer or it's multiple choice or it's true or false or the, how the matching works. Um, so I'm gonna try to be better at that on the quiz itself. Because um, in one of them, I think it was like um, I asked you guys about microscopes, right? And I was trying to get you guys to think like, hey, what technique can you use? And it was like one of the things I was trying to be exaggerated, but like for the elephant leaf, it's like this big, like it's a huge leaf, right? There, if you guys remember the drawing where we're talking about the microscopes, it's like a microscope because it zooms in so much, you can only capture a really small portion of, of a tissue and you can't see anything else. So if you're trying to take a picture of something that's two meters big, you know, your microscope, you'd be there for like a year just taking pictures over and over trying to get into the whole thing. So for that, you can only use the, uh, the light microscope. Oh, sorry, the light microscope, not the light, uh, your eyes or a camera, right? That's that magnification from uh, kilometers to uh, centimeters is kind of like where all your eyes 
I mean, mine probably, had, you know, I, I don't know if I make it centimeters now, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's limited, right? Then you shift over to the next window, which is the second part was for an example of um, if we were looking on the surface of the leaf itself and we were looking at cells that are like microns by microns. And there I wanted you, there I kind of messed up, or maybe the question was too clear was, what can I use to image that? And if you look at the range for a light microscope and the range for electron microscope, they both overlap. Like you can image uh, microns with both of them. So the, the second answer was you had to put like the, for that second sample on both light and electron microscopes, it would work. So that's why I was a little bit off. And then one of the ones that I messed up was, uh, I think almost you, know, you got it right, was for the question talking about the mitochondria and the Golgi, right? So what does the mitochondria do? ATP, ATP, yes. And then the, the Golgi? Transport. Transport. Transport, yeah. But I spelled mitochondria with uh, an extra R, so everyone got it wrong. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I need to fix that right now. Yeah, but they, I was tripping out because it kept saying other, and I was like, why does it say other? And everyone got it wrong. I was like, this is nice. Um, but yeah, so that should be good. All right, so I'll try, to, I'll try to make it clear about those. The matching one should be okay. And um, I haven't done any fill in the blanks yet, but I think those might be a little. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I do have a fill in the blank question. And it's like, it asks, like, it gives you a story of how something works. And then I give two different types of examples. Or I like how it works in different organisms. So when I put one organism and the other organism, and I'm expecting them to answer it. Yeah. All right, any other big questions? Small questions. So what percentage of the test on Wednesday will be like from chapter one and like chapter two? Since that's like an introduction to like what we're doing on Wednesday. So let me think. So chapter one was the, the unifying uh, like organization yeah I'm trying to divide it pretty evenly okay. yeah so I feel like the first one because it's it's a way to our like how we appreciate bio right it's like feel comfortable with the themes okay. right you should feel comfortable with them like uh, information um, what was the other one? Um, energy and matter. Energy and matter. See, that one I went a lot less over than the other ones, right? So when you're studying, I normally look at my slides, and whichever slide has the like the most sections for that specific topic is the one that I kind of went into greater detail with you guys. So you can use that to help narrow down your area of focus. Like, like this question shows, right? Like it's like, hey, I didn't go over isomers that much. So it's like, you know, I'm probably not going to ask about isomers, right? Um, like the other stuff, like cytoskeleton, like which ones are my favorites? Microspheres. No, it's sir. And then what's the other one? Microfilaments. Yeah, it's the ones I hate. Intermediate filaments. Yeah. Big filaments, guys. Don't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so use that to kind of help guide you when you study the chemistry one, which is number two. That one. To be honest, because we're studying bio, we're not really like. Like, like, how often we're going to bring up valence electrons going forward is going to be rare, right? Or, or like uh, the protons and the neutrons is it, not useful at the end. But what are the stuff that from that slides that are super important that I'm always talking about? Types of bonds, charges, right? The types of bonds. I'm like, is it hydrophobic? Is it polar? Is it nonpolar? Is it hydrophilic? Um, ionic is going to come out later, but you know, it's one of the ones where they are useful. So those are the things where I'm like, I am going to squeeze that out of those PowerPoints. You know, knowing the mass of, a, of an electron, you know, it's not going to be an art. The magnification we work at, we kind of don't care. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah. it's always like we don't care, you know? Yes. What all do we need to know about, like, monomers, polymers, polysaccharides? Polysaccharides. I define all three to me. Um, a monomer is used to bond polymers together. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't bond it together. Makes, uh, like the monomers it's make up double 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 double. Double. It's small subunits of the polymers. So, so in, 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 in relative terms here, each one of you in my class is a monomer, right? If I put two of you together in a group, it's a dimer, right? And then if I link up the whole class, then that's considered a polymer. Yeah. yeah. 
that's pretty much what you need to know. Because <laughs> I'm gonna because that's a, an idea of how things link up, but in reality, you know where I'm gonna come. I'm, I'm gonna push it. I'm gonna be like, hey, you need glasses, monomers. This is a monomer. Here we have a dimer showing up. But we have another one. Now we have a poly polymer. Same thing with DNA. Right. All right. Let me see what else. Oh yeah, I was gonna show a slide. Somebody got me. I was like, I was like, I love this picture. It's super awesome. And then I was like. The, the one I, on the slides, I said I hated it. And then you guys put it up here, and I was like, you guys are bullies. <laughs> that picture up there, right? <laughs> At first, I was excited. I was like, this picture looks dope. I love it, because how I explain oxygen and hydrogen, right? But in the class, I said I did, and I was like, they got it wrong. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh, it's wrong here, too. Right? <laughs> and I'll look this close to what I'll throw it in the test, but I, I don't know. So what's wrong with this picture? Oxygen's bonded with oxygen. Yeah, yeah um, that's what got me. But everything else, I loved it because I was like, this is what I'm trying to get across, right? That your oxygen and hydrogens, that's your corporeal covalent bond, right? That's a, like that part of like, it's one thing. Relatively, it's the stable thing. Then they have this second type of interaction, which is that cohesion. But if that like arm was coming from the hydrogen, you know, it would be dope. I might, I might have to Photoshop it and then I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll make it like because I do like it. And then uh, I also know this part. Okay, so this part, it's the same thing. It's like, hey, you can see the other stuff, but it'll do the same thing. It, they have to be polar for the interaction to happen. Yeah. So that was good. You guys got me. Awesome. And let me think. So slide three. No lecture. What was lecture three about? Water. Yeah, you gotta know water. That one. Everybody loves water. Um, so water. With its hydrogens, electrons, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm not going to go heavy into the electrons for water. What I do care about water is polarity and talking about hydrophobicity, right? Hydrophobic, hydrophilic, that type of interaction. But I've been pretty hard on you guys, like every homework, I've been bringing that up. And I'd be like, hey, keep telling me about it, keep telling about it. So that's what I'm going to push for you guys. Then, to be honest, it's like when you figure out all the stuff that it can do for us, like the important things, right? How it can bind to itself, how it can control temperature by taking up a bunch of energy and avoiding the temperature to rise, or it can freeze things, or it, it, when it freezes, it expands, so it floats. Those are like the big properties of what would help us in life. So those are the things where I'm like, hey, make sure you feel comfortable with those. And the fact that all of them are coming from like, this hydrogen bond, yeah. Lecture five. All right, let's see this one. So for this one, again, it was a way to introduce you guys to the other ones. We've done carbohydrates very little, which are sugars. I've talked a little bit when it talks to the cell wall. Or like you said, your example of monomer, or what you call uh, monosaccharide, disaccharide, and the polysaccharides. You guys seem to have been a lot more heavy on the proteins and the nucleic acid. Yeah. So still go through it, feel comfortable with the other ones, know the definitions, but you know that the ones I'm gonna focus on the, a little bit more on is gonna be your your, your proteins and your, and your DNA because those are the, like the, the, the stuff we've covered so far really heavily. Um, yeah, I feel like the steroids I, I I like sprinkled it like it was salt on food like it was just like steroids they have functional groups right so go light on the steroids the phospholipids that one. Uh, what are the key things you have to learn about phospholipids? Hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. Exactly. Two parts. Know which one's the hydrophobic, which is the hydrophilic, and then know how it's super important to building shells around organisms, right? Around organisms and around uh, what are they called? Organ systems or organelles, right? How to build shells around organelles because they basically act like a sphere of a particle. So it's charge. It's going to affect, and its size will affect if you can make it through. And for the most part, it's going to act like a shield. All right. Number six, the nucleic acids. Just know everything. I love nucleic acids. So I'm just kidding. I just know the stuff that I went over, right? Here is how the chain works, how to call it out, like how it's patterned. And then just know that there's four different types of bases. Those bases, they give us some cool benefits, but it's like what we talked in the homework, right? It's information in the order they appear. Because of their hydrogen bonds, we can create copies of it. 
One of them is for replicating. The other copy is for your RNA to make your protein. So that, that ability to temporarily bond with hydrogen bonds is the whole reason why we're able to do so many functions at low energy costs, right? Because if we had to make and break covalent bonds to bind DNA, we don't make an RNA, it'd be super expensive for us. All right, DNA, RNA, fossil bonds. I think I want to do this one pretty well. Mixturate for the proteins. Um, yeah, so this one, same thing. Know the five parts, the carbon and the four things that attach to it, and then uh, be able to call out the groups. This, let me think for this one, for the different structures, I feel like I went over it, but I don't know how in depth I went over it with you guys. You guys remember the primary, secondary, and tertiary stuff? Yeah? All right. So this one I think would be, <clears throat> I think definitions, I, I don't think, I think we barely hit ordinary or just two proteins working together. So normally it's kind of stick up here, like primary and secondary, which would be primary is just the amino acids in a row from N to C. Secondary is if this backbone, right, interacts back with itself, it'll make coils or it can make like big, it can make the data sheets. Yeah, data sheets are off like this. That's pretty much as much as you need to know for those guys. Uh, all right. No notes on that one, huh? You guys are good? I think this is when we started talking about the organelles, right? So I started bringing up the different <clears throat> compartments there. Know the name of the organelles and know what they do, right? So I remember I was telling you guys, figure out your keywords for each organelle or that key function. Um, so then uh, feel comfortable with those. The other one is cells two. What was this one? It's like skeleton. Oh, this is the last one. I think at the first it was the membranes. Then it jumped into like the organelles and how they each bring different things. You know, there I'm going to love to put some compare and contrast stuff, right? Because there's what we brought up eukaryotes and prokaryotes, right? Uh, eukaryotes, us, the fancy, the fancy cells, right? We have all those different compartments. We're bigger. We hold our nucleus, our DNA in the nucleus. And then we have to work through these different membranes. Prokaryotes, they're lazy. They're just one single cell. They have everything in the mix. It makes it easier for them to just make our DNA right where the RNA is at. Uh, you have to make RNA right where the DNA is at. They can make their proteins all locally. It doesn't need to go through different membranes or different compartments. And this one, you guys already talked about it. You know my favorites on this side. Uh, yeah, so I'll do these two bold. This is like lowercase bold. <laughs> And then um, this is important because now we're getting into, this is everything inside of the cell. Or sorry, yeah, this is inside of the cell and then here's the jump to outside the cell. So no, feel comfortable with these two, right? Which is the difference between an animal and a, and a plant. I uh, remember I love plants, but I think they went more into detail with this one. And these type of jumps are also important, right? Um, they help communicate across cells. That's one thing. They also can function to help attach them to each other which I think this is your desmosome. And then finally, your tight junction is, that's a function that they do together for, for, for the organism as a whole, right? That's the one where they kind of build like a wedge around themselves. They kind of act like a shield where no liquid will pass through any of the cell parts. And that's it. Start studying, go through the organelles. The big thing I want you guys to be thinking about is how are the stuff working together to build up the cell, right? Like individual. I'll see you guys here on Wednesday. I'm wearing my coat because it's battle time, you guys. It's going to be serious. 55 minutes, and then you guys. I have office hours today after this for two hours. Tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 11. Wednesday morning from 9.30 to 11. Thank you.